When I started this channel, I was a Pokemon-loving nerd who wanted to make some fun content and connect with other people who also loved these games. The issue was that I didn't know very much about the games. I'd played through them casually for my entire life and rarely looked at the stats or a type chart. Pokemon was a way for me to escape everyday life, have some fun catching and raising cute or intimidating creatures, and relive the experience of starting as a scrub and rising to become the powerful champion. Almost a year later, I'm an even bigger Pokemon nerd. I've found an awesome community to share Pokemon with, and I know significantly more about the games. I even know Venomoth's typing now. My previous lack of knowledge makes it hard for me to watch my older videos. But this helped me realize something. Perhaps the journey is what's really the most interesting thing. From scrub to champion. I did say that that's why I play these games. I get to repeat that process of growth over and over. Perhaps it's been fun to watch me learn, or to learn alongside me. In that spirit, I'm revisiting two of my earliest runs that I did on this channel. I want to be able to apply all the lessons I've learned since I started, and give these two awesome Pokemon the playthroughs they really deserve. Today is Beedrill vs Butterfree. These two Pokemon are the two early game bugs. They have the same base stat totals, but are designed to fill different roles. Beedrill is a physical attacker and is more offensively suited, and Butterfree is a special attacker and loaded up with status moves. Their level up learn sets are alright, with Beedrill learning Twin Needle and Butterfree getting Psybeam. But TMs are where these two obtain their most powerful moves. Beedrill gets access to the Incredible Swords Dance, and Butterfree gets Psychic. In my previous Beedrill video, I used Agility to stack the Badge Boost glitch to make it through the Elite Four. This is so hard to watch looking back on it now, and it may have been really hard for some of you to watch too. Swords Dance is so powerful, if only I had used it before. Butterfree needs a way to compete with this incredible move though, and that comes in the form of Generation 1 sleep mechanics. In modern Pokemon, you wake up from sleep and attack in the same turn, but in Generation 1, it takes an entire turn to just wake up. So Beedrill will leverage the Gen 1 jank with Swords Dance and the Badge Boost glitch, while Butterfree is going to be Mr. Sandman and lay some smack down to its foes while they drift off to sleep. You think it's just a cute butterfly? You wait. If you find what I do entertaining, like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, share the video with a friend, and grab a dome fossil. If you want to support beyond that, consider becoming a Patreon. Link in the description. Today we're going to be doing something a bit different in this versus video. Here's the rules. The Pokemon that finishes the game with the fastest time when saving between the Elite Four members will score one point. An additional point will be given to the Pokemon that finishes this part of the race with the lowest level. The Pokemon that finishes the game without saving between the Elite Four members will score one point. I'll attempt both of these scenarios with both Pokemon, and another point will be given out here for the lowest level finish of a consistent league run. If there's a tie, I'll determine the winner based on which Pokemon had to reset fewer times throughout the run. I'll only use either Beedrill or Butterfree in battle, I won't use any items in battle, and I won't use any glitches, with the notable exception of the Badge Boost glitch, which will be only used if the stat the move was improving would already have a material effect on the battle, so no boosting speed or defense when they aren't relevant just to get the Badge Boost. Finally, I'll use 3 rare candies after losing in the league 5 times in a row. I want to approach leveling in the late game slowly, so that Pokemon can win at the lowest level possible, and this also makes the battles more exciting. Obviously, we could just use all the rare candies right away and get the fastest possible time for these Pokemon, but that's pretty boring. Since the performance of these two Pokemon is so important, I'm going to be resetting for decent DVs, or determinate values. These were replaced with the more well-known IVs in Generation 3 and beyond. DVs range from 0 to 15, and each DV value corresponds to a certain stat value at a specific level. Weedle has a unique stat value in attack when it has a 15 in its DV. For Caterpie, it has a unique value in speed and defense when those DVs are 15. 
So I reset until I get the bugs with the highest values in the most important stats. This gives us the most even start possible using only in-game information. Let's go. The rival's EV makes quick work of my tiny caterpillars. After that, I've got to fully evolve these Pokemon. Butterfree is a bit harder to obtain because Caterpie and Metapod require more trips to the Pokemon Center while training. Additionally, the rival battle west of Viridian is a bit scary with Butterfree. Spearow and Eevee can deal good damage. However, the early game still heavily favors Butterfree. Many of us as kids use this cutie to confuse our way through Brock when playing Pokemon Yellow for the first time. Unfortunately for Beedrill, it isn't going to learn a move that's strong against him until level 20. In Generation 1, Type determines if a move uses the attack stat or the special stat. Bug moves are physical attacks, and there are only three of them in Generation 1. Leech Life, Pin Missile, and Twin Needle. They are super effective against Grass, Poison, and Psychic types in this generation as well. Rock and Ground types don't resist Bug though, so Twin Needle is how Beedrill is going to defeat Brock. It's fair for you to think, wouldn't Fury Attack in combination with Focus Energy have potential? Especially since in Generation 1, when one of your hits crits, all of them crit. Well, unfortunately in Generation 1, Focus Energy is bugged. And it quarters your critical hit chance rather than multiplying it by 4 as intended. While training Beedrill, I came up with an idea. I'm going to stop leveling at level 16, but get enough experience so that I can level up to 20 during the Brock fight. This allows me to skip at least 4 encounters in Viridian Forest. Because of this, I have to defeat the Geodude with Poison Sting and Fury Attack. Uh, here I forgot that Brock has what feels like infinite full heals, so I was using Poison Sting to try to poison Geodude, but that doesn't work. It finally faints, and then I level up and learn Twin Needle. Look how much damage that does. It feels so good to finally defeat him. Beedrill finishes with a time of 34 minutes and 7 seconds. That's 16 minutes and 14 seconds behind Butterfree. The rival on Nugget Bridge is easy. Butterfree has learned Sleep Powder at this point, and this is going to be my go-to tactic. The majority of this run is going to be put the opponent to sleep and then spam psychic moves and knock them out. Unfortunately, when I was a kid, I spammed A when learning Whirlwind and deleted Sleep Powder from my Butterfree, so I actually never got a chance to use this cheesy tactic growing up. Hopefully though, many of you got the chance to use it. It's time for Misty. Staryu is simple, but Starmie's Bubble Beam is dealing a lot of damage to Butterfree. I miss a Sleep Powder and Starmie knocks me out. Let's try that again. On the second fight, I put it to sleep, and then use Supersonic. Double status conditions. Yeah, be frustrated, Misty. You'll notice that my PP isn't very high. That's because I skipped healing after Nugget Bridge to get a better time. In the end, I don't need the extra PP. I can make do with what I have, and knock the Starmie out. On the SSN, Butterfree grabs Rest, the Rare Candy, and the Max Ether. I picked this up because my PP is running low again, and I want to ensure that I can dig back to Cerulean after Surge. I use the Max Ether to recharge my PP before taking care of the rival. In Surge's gym, I pause the timer. We're not having any RNG affect the times of these playthroughs. Time to stick my hand in a bunch of trash cans. Uh, do you think they fill these with fake trash? Do they have an agreement with the, like, the local landfills that trash is regularly provided to them? Is it just like a bunch of trubbishes hanging out in the garbage cans? That would be pretty cute. Surge is brutal. Raichu gets X speed and then goes to sleep. But Confusion is doing almost nothing to it. And because of the X speed, when it wakes up, it outspeeds. It knocks Butterfree out. On the second fight, Raichu lands Thunderbolt. Yeah, that's not good. With how many times I get through this fight on luck alone, I'm due for some bad luck like that. On the third fight, I get the sleep status setups that I need, and I knock Raichu out. The hiker in the tunnel is scary because of rock throw and self-destruct. I try to skip sleep powder, but confusion doesn't take care of the Geodude. Because of this, I lose the first fight. That was pretty sloppy. On the second fight, I spam sleep, and that allows me to win easily. 
I will never forget the pain that this fight was with Voltorb. I've got to do a Magnemite run at some point, and I'm really worried about how it's going to be in that run. South of Lavender Town, I pick up Swift. This will help Butterfree with Pokemon who resist Psychic-type attacks or have high special. In Celadon, I grab the items I need from the department store and get a flyer that can actually learn fly. If only Butterfree could learn a flying-type move in Generation 1. Then I grab the TM for Psychic, teach it to Butterfree, and use the two Celadon PP ups on it. This makes the rocket hideout a breeze. No more PP problems for Butterfree. Erica is next, and she's known for draining my PP in Johto, but this time I've got Psychic on my side, so it's not going to be a problem. She opens with Tangela, and I take it slow here with Sleep. I thought I could one-hit Weepin' Bell, but it survives, and lands an acid dealing a lot of damage. Maybe Psychic isn't all I need. I take a risk against Gloom again, and it lands acid too. However, it's not enough to finish me off. Probably not the best choices in that fight. Sleep Spam would have been safer and more consistent. Either way, Butterfree finishes Erica with a time of 52 minutes and 2 seconds. Now. Can Beedrill catch up? After Brock, I'm very overleveled, so I can speed through the next route. In Mount Moon, Dome Fossil. Obviously. On Nugget Bridge, I'm going to skip Pokemon Center visits. To do this, I purchase potions to heal. If my PP is low, I'll use the Hidden Elixir to restore it. I pull it off and get through all the trainers without having to head back to Cerulean. I grab the Hidden Aether after the last. This is going to help me skipping the heal in Vermilion and allow me to dig back to Cerulean. Misty is next. Beedrill's high attack stat lets it make quick work of Staryu. Next is Starmie, and for once the psychic typing is actually a weakness. Twin Needle does massive damage but doesn't quite knock it out. She uses X Defend and that allows Beedrill to defeat her without taking a single hit point of damage. Now I'm going to skip healing in Vermilion as I said before. I make my way directly to the SSN, and the only TM I need in here is Rest. I also do pick up the rare candy. Surge should be manageable. He uses X speed first turn, and my Twin Needle does just under half damage. Raichu then lands Mega Kick, and yikes! Beedrill just barely survives. My following Twin Needle doesn't knock it out, but it does poison it. Because Growl is his next choice, Beedrill is victorious. With that out of the way, I dig back to Cerulean, heal up, grab the bike, and purchase repels. I notably forget potions here, which is unfortunate, because the self-destructing hiker is up next. This guy is like a recurring cast member in my Kanto videos. The terrifying thing about him in this playthrough is that Beedrill's Twin Needle doesn't knock his Pokemon out in a single hit. I do manage to knock out the first Geodude without it blowing up. The second one doesn't either, but it lands Rock Throw. Please don't explode, Graveler. It uses Defense Curl, and it takes itself out of KO range with that defense boost. Then, it goes for Rock Throw, but misses. I did it on my first attempt. Luck was certainly required there, though. Now I can upgrade Beedrill's moveset in the same way that I upgraded Butterfreeze. South of Lavender Town, I pick up Swift. This is a really cool normal move that bypasses accuracy checks. So, all these times when I was so pissed off at Sandshrew, I should have just remembered that this move existed. With how much I hate that little guy, uh, this should probably be my favorite move. The Rocket Hideout is next. I'm going to complete the entire plotline now. Two reasons. Money and Swords Dance. By the way, uh, here's a joke, courtesy of a viewer. So, it's less cringy than my usual humor. When you give an Eevee a Thunderstone, it becomes a Jolteon. So what happens when you give Eevee money? I'll let you think for a moment. It becomes a Patreon. You should too. The reason I'm so interested in money in this run is that I want to buy Beedrill Hyper Beam. The Sword Stance Hyper Beam combo is going to be incredible in the late game. After completing Pokemon Tower, I head directly to Sylph. There's a lot of high cost items in here, as well as the TM for Swords Dance. I pick it up right away and teach it to Beedrill. I do attempt the rival at this level, but it feels a bit too hard because of Sandslash's attacks preventing me from setting up. I'll just come back here later. 
I haven't even done Erica yet after all. She's simple. Twin Needle is super effective against all her Pokemon, and four times effective against her dual types. At least I won't arrive at Giovanni's gym and realize that I forgot her. Beedrill gets a time of 1 hour, 12 minutes, and 36 seconds. Here's the splits so far. Beedrill gained ground in the Misty and Surge portion of the playthrough, but lost time at Erica. This is simply because Beedrill took care of the majority of the rocket plotline and Butterfree has not yet. My little psychic flying butterfly is still in a gargantuan lead though, but maybe Swords Dance will help Beedrill become competitive. We're cheering for the underdog, right? I love Butterfree, but I want Beedrill to close the gap. This needs to be much closer. As a gift, Erica gives out Mega Drain. I've got to save this for Lorelei with Butterfree. It's probably going to be useful there. Now I head to Pokemon Tower. This place is great for training with Butterfree, so I spend some additional time fighting the Chandlers. With that out of the way, I head south to fight Koga. In his gym, Butterfree runs into a small obstacle. This psychic with four Pokemon is really annoying. He poisons Butterfree and KOs it soon after. The issue here is that I can't deal much damage to his Pokemon. Luckily though, Butterfree can rely on sleep, so in the next attempt, I manage to defeat him. There is another mandatory trainer in here who has a Drowsy and a Hypno who is sometimes hard, however this fight goes a lot smoother in this run. Koga's next. Simple strategy. Use Sleep Powder first turn against every Pokemon and then spam Psychic. This is great because his Pokemon are bug poison types. They also love to spam status conditions, so keeping them asleep prevents most of the frustration in this battle. His Ace Venomoth comes out. It would be so cool if in Generation 9 they gave this thing a Bug Poison regional variant. That way Venonat would retain its typing when it evolved. Generation 1 is so strange. The Poison type gym leader has a Flying Grass type ace. Sylph is another opportunity for Butterfree to train up. As Blaine is coming up next, I'm gonna need to be stronger. The rival here is mostly easy. On my first fight I get to Vaporeon but I miss sleep. It uses Aurora Beam and knocks me out. However, the second attempt is much smoother. Sleep and Psychic. Broken status condition and broken typing, working together to defeat all of Kanto with ease. I choose to do Blaine next, because his badge gives me a special boost, which will be useful against Sabrina. I bought the TM for Reflect when I was in Celadon, and now this is going to be useful, because Rapidash and Arcanine hit really hard with physical attacks. Rapidash outspeeds Butterfree and uses Fire Spin. However, it misses, and that allows me to put it to sleep. Then I make the decision to use Swift when it's at a sliver of health, but Blaine heals it with a Super Potion. I really should have just kept using Psychic and finished it off. Arcanine is next. It outspeeds and uses Flamethrower. That did so much damage. But I survive, and I put it to sleep. This is tense. I'm not doing much damage, and I have so little health left. It needs to stay asleep. And it does, allowing Butterfree to use 5 attacks and knock it out. Sabrina is next. I put Abra to sleep, and that's sort of overkill since I have Swift as an attack. I get a bit reckless against the Kadabra and knock it out without sleep. Am I gonna pay for that? Alakazam gets both Reflect and X Defend so my first Swift does almost nothing. I use Psychic from here because I could lower Alakazam's special. It wakes up and due to its high speed uses Recover before falling back to sleep. The next time it wakes up, it uses Psy Wave and takes Butterfree all the way down to eight hit points. Please stay asleep. It does, and after landing a critical hit which depletes the majority of Alakazam's health, I finish it off with two more Swifts. So I ended up not having to pay for my carelessness against Kadabra. Giovanni is the last challenge before the end game. I make weird choices against Dugtrio. I could have just set up Reflect on it because its only damage dealing moves are ground type. Additionally in this generation I could use Swift against it when it goes underground. Sleep was really pointless here. Since Reflect is in place, I can knock it out and move on. Against all his other Pokemon, sleep is required to avoid damage. I miss against Nidoking, and Thunder damages Butterfree, 
but doesn't quite knock it out. Ride on is last. My childhood terror. The single Pokemon that made me question if Butterfree was really the strongest Pokemon of them all. I miss Sleep Powder, and it uses Rock Slide. But it misses. This luck lets me put it to sleep and land two Psychics, the last of which is a critical hit. Butterfree finishes the gym challenge, with a time of 1 hour, 23 minutes, and 0 seconds. Looking at Beedrill's time, things don't look good. We'd have to do 4 gyms in 10 minutes to catch up with Butterfree. At Koga, Twin Needle Spam won't work. His Pokemon survive it and deal too much damage with super effective Psychics. I should have just used Sword Stance initially, because only one turn of setup with that would have made this fight a breeze. After the single turn of setup, Twin Needle can take out all of his Pokemon in a single turn. I do a bit of training in Sylph, mirroring Butterfree's approach. This makes the rival here easier. I set up against Sand Slash, which is the tensest part of the fight. Slash does so much damage. I survive three turns, and get to set up fully. After that, Beedrill can just immediately sweep the rest of his team. Now that I've collected enough money and items, I can head to Celadon and sell off a bunch of high-priced vitamins and nuggets, and then invest a sizable amount of time in buying coins. This process is so painful in a race. I can just feel myself getting behind while I stand here. However, Hyper Beam is going to help Beedrill out, and so I think that the time invested now will be worth it in the end. Blaine is next. I want the special boost for Sabrina, who has super effective psychic moves. Blaine opens with Ninetales, and I set up one turn of Sword Stance. Because of how powerful Hyper Beam is, this might be all that I need. I would rather not set up anymore, since I assume that Flamethrower is going to knock me out in a single hit. I take the Ninetales down in a single hit, and the Rapidash as well. Now, prepare to feel the vicarious regret. I hit Arcanine with Hyper Beam, and it survives. It uses Takedown, and I have to recharge because I didn't knock it out. That gives it a turn to set up Reflect. Because Hyper Beam has lower accuracy, I choose Twin Needle to knock it out, but it survives because it resists Bug-type attacks. Why didn't I just use Swift? The pain is so real, and it gets even worse. I try this fight several times, but I just can't beat him. I'm forced to train up. It takes a total of 11 attempts to finally get victory. It was so close on the first fight. I made a terrible move choice and paid a heavy price. Luckily, Sabrina isn't an issue for Beedrill. I set up Swords Dance and then use Swift against her Pokemon. In retrospect, it would have been safer to just set up all three Swords Dances against Abra. Swift ensures that my attacks are going to land, despite Abra's flash spam. Either way, I get to progress. So Giovanni. Yeah, this one is bad, just like Blaine. I can make it to ride on, but not defeat it. The solution here is reflect and additional training. At level 56, I can set up first turn mitigating damage from Dugtrio. I, uh, I guess Pokemon that have wings in their design aren't always flying types. I, uh, I might need to reflect on that. On the next turn, I knock it out and complete my setup on Persian. After that, I can now sweep his entire remaining team except Rhydon. It comes out and uses Rock Slide. But this time, I survive, and I knock it out. Beedrill completes the gym challenge with a time of 2 hours, 3 minutes, and 6 seconds. It's now 40 minutes behind Butterfree. In a perfect world, I think I could have gotten a better time by investing more in training before Blaine and Giovanni. For both Pokemon, the final rival is easy. I record their pre-league time when they're ready to go. Butterfree has a better time and is at a lower level. Sleep has allowed it to avoid the mid-game training that Beedrill just couldn't. Beedrill does have an incredible moveset though. Twin Needle is great for dealing with Agatha's ghosts, and the Hyper Beam Swords Dance combo can take care of almost everything else. Reflect is present for Lance and Bruno. First, I'll complete the league with saves in between each member. Then I'll be completing the league without saves. There are four points on the line. Who do you think is going to win them? For Beedrill, the fight against Lorelei is easy. 
Dugong provides a great opportunity to set up. After that, Hyperbeam sweeps her entire team until Lapras. It survives due to a critical hit, so that's just bad luck. But her attack doesn't KO Beedrill, and Lapras faints on the next turn. I'm moving on. Bruno gives me an embarrassing loss. Against Hitmonchan, my Hyperbeam misses. I didn't use an elixir before the fight, so I'm running low on PP, and then I get burned. I try using Twin Needle, and then I faint. On the second fight, it is much smoother. I use Reflect against Onyx to mitigate damage from Rock Slide, set up Swords Dance, and then sweep. This is how the fight is supposed to go. This pattern repeats against Agatha. I get really bad confusion luck in the first fight and knock myself out. However, since Twin Needle is super effective, I'm able to breeze by her when I don't hit myself. Lance, on the other hand, is very hard. Gyarados allows a bit of setup, but I need to be careful to only take a small amount of damage from it. Hyper Beam and Hydro Pump do a lot of damage to Beedrill. This is the spot that makes this fight difficult. Because I lost 5 times already, I've used 3 rare candies. At this level, I outspeed and knock the Aerodactyl out with Hyper Beam. The Dragonite is last, and it's easy if I've gotten this far with full setup. It goes down. It's champion time. The first two fights are tough because I try to knock Sandslash out so I can set up on Executor. Turns out that setting up on Sandslash is the best choice. You might ask, why isn't the AI prioritizing Earthquake as Sandslash does know it during this fight? Well, the AI has an order in which it checks super effectiveness. Before playing this run, I didn't know that the AI's move selection was linked to the internal prioritization in any way. This list of priorities is also the reason that the text glitch occurs that displays the wrong, like, it's not very effective or it's super effective message. In the third fight, I set up at the start, and this trivializes the fight. I sweep through his entire team, and Beedrill finishes the game with a time of 2 hours, 20 minutes, and 30 seconds. Beedrill also gets a low level finish, at level 65. The only thing holding it back from a significantly better playthrough time is Brock who is roughly one-fourth of the run's entire time. Lorelei is seriously tough for Butterfree. While Mega Drain is helpful, it doesn't make me feel confident in the fight because my PP is an issue. In this case, it's not how you use it that matters. On my fifth fight though, I end up getting ridiculously lucky and get three turns in a row of critical hits, and that takes Lapras out. So I got really lucky here and I am moving on but this fight could be a problem when I can't save between League members. Bruno is one fight that Butterfree doesn't need to use Sleep Powder. I can just spam Psychic and sweep his entire team. After relying on this unpredictable yet broken status for so long, it's refreshing to just be able to attack. Against Agatha, Psychic is super effective, but most of the ghosts will take two hits because they have high special. I get through the first four Pokemon without running into too many issues. In retrospect, taking things slower here with sleep might have been safer, but I end up at the final Gengar either way. Then it confuses Butterfree, which leads to a turn of confusion damage. Gengar then wastes its next turn with Dream Eater, allowing me to snap out of confusion. Sleep powder time, but I miss. Gengar uses Psychic, taking Butterfree down to orange health. After putting it to sleep, I heal up with rest. When I wake up, a few tense turns pass where we both miss. Butterfree finally puts it to sleep again and takes the victory. Lance is a wall for Butterfree. The Gyarados can easily knock us out and takes very little damage from all of our attacks. The first Dragonair isn't too much of an issue, but the second Dragonair can freeze Butterfree with a super effective Ice Beam, and then Aerodactyl outspeeds with super effective flying attacks. If we can make it past all of that, three of Dragonite's four moves are super effective, and Hyper Beam is devastating because of our defense stat. I lose a lot here, so I end up using three rare candies after my first five losses. Try again. Five more times, and still no luck. Okay, three more rare candies. I do this until fight 20. There is only one rare candy left now. After that, I've got a blackout and train up if it isn't possible. Due to a special drop, Gyarados goes down in 3 hits. The Dragonair are now 2 hits at this level. 
However, on the second one, I miss Sleep Powder and it uses Ice Beam. Okay, it didn't freeze us, good. I'm moving on to Aerodactyl. I use Sleep Powder, but it still outspeeds. Fly leaves Butterfree with two hit points. I thought the most clutch victory was incoming, but Butterfree misses Sleep Powder and Aerodactyl knocks it out. I've lost 20 times now, so I use my final rare candy and attempt Lance again. This final rare candy isn't the clutch thing that I needed with Butterfree. However, I keep going because I'm pretty frustrated and I'm stubborn, and on fight 26, I get my stats lowered which triggers the badge boost glitch. This badge boost glitch actually allows Butterfree to then outspeed the Aerodactyl and put it to sleep. For the first time, I'm moving on to the champion, and Butterfree only has a 15 minute lead on Beedrill now. I miss my first sleep powder and Sandslash poisons me. That means I need to heal. I wake up and use Psychic, which does good damage, and Sandslash faints after two hits. Alakazam is next. Double Edge is on my moveset entirely so that I can knock out this spoon bending Pokemon and the following Executor. This strange coconut tree pineapple egg headed Psychic thing can't output much damage, so I heal up before moving on. Both Ninetales and Magneton could be awful, but Sleep does its job and I knock them out. Vaporeon is last. My Sleep Powder lasts forever and I can slowly whittle it down with Psychics. Double Edge might do more here as Vaporeon has a low defense stat, but I want to conserve my own HP in the case it hits an Aurora Beam. Butterfree defeats the champion and completes the game with a time of 2 hours, 6 minutes and 1 seconds. 14 minutes and 29 seconds faster than Beedrill. It gets one point for that. However, Beedrill wins the second point because it finished the league at a lower level. Now let's see what happens when these two Pokemon are unable to save between league members. Will the results be similar or dramatically different? Here we go. Beedrill is victorious against Lorelei on its first attempt at level 58. I'm not even gonna try to hype this one up. She sends out Dugong, and due to its propensity to spam rest, I can easily set up three sword stances and sweep with Hyper Beam. The only inconsistency here is that Hyper Beam could miss or get a critical hit. Generation 1, the games where critical hits negate your setup and ruin your chances of victory. I love these games. Bruno is next. I set up sword stance against the first Onyx. From here, I use Hyper Beam against the Fighting types, and Twin Needle against the Rock Ground types. Remember, they don't resist Bug. Another easy fight. The only way I can imagine Beedrill losing this fight is if Onyx lands a critical hit with Rock Slide, which is unlikely due to its base speed. I find it so funny that I struggled in this fight in my previous video. It's so easy for Beedrill if I just have Swords Dance on my moveset. Twin Needle is super effective against Agatha's ghosts. The real danger here is Confusion. As Swords Dance gets set up, the damage that I deal to myself in Confusion also increases. So here I hit myself twice versus the Golbat and Faint. On the first three League members, Agatha is the least consistent for this reason. On my second attempt at the League, I again defeat Lorelei and Bruno with ease and make it back to Agatha. I only need two turns of setup here. After I've avoided Confusion, I then sweep her team with Twin Needle. This move is great for everything except Golbat, and Hyper Beam picks up the slack there. Lance is next. I've reached him on my second attempt. Gyarados is the first scary Pokemon. Its Hyper Beam is devastating. I set up Swords Dance twice because I know that I can tank Hydro Pump or Dragon Rage, and then I knock it out with Hyper Beam. The Dragonairs are next. First turn, I set up Reflect. They can do a lot of damage if they use Hyper Beam. I probably should have just set this up on the Gyarados. It will also help surviving Aerodactyl's first super effective flying attack. After resting up, I knock out the Dragonairs with Hyper Beam. Aerodactyl is next. It has a 25% chance of getting a critical hit, and one of these would be the end for Beedrill. I choose a risky play and go for a third Swords Dance. It hits me with Wing Attack, but Reflect prevents a lot of the damage. Next turn, I use Hyper Beam, and it faints. Dragonite is last. I outspeed with Hyper Beam and knock it out as well. Only two attempts, and I've reached the champion. 
I set up Reflect immediately. In retrospect, the only Pokemon that are going to hit me with physical moves are Sandslash and Executor. I could probably skip this. With three turns of setup of Sword Stance, I begin to sweep. Alakazam is a one hit. Executor is a one hit as well. Ninetales comes out and I miss Hyper Beam, letting it trap me and Fire Spin. However, it only lasts two turns and then Beedrill knocks Ninetales out. Magneton is a one hit. Vaporeon is last. I outspeed, land Hyper Beam, and Beedrill has completed Pokemon Yellow. When attempting to defeat the league consistently without saves, I got a better time than playing with saves. I learned a few things the first time around, and what this proves is that Beedrill is very capable of taking the entire Elite Four on at a relatively low level, even without saving. So how does Butterfree do against the League without saving? Lorelei is first. While Dugong, Cloyster, and Slowbro all can knock Butterfree out, and occasionally do, the real issue is Jinx. Psychic and Mega Drain can't do much damage to it. When it wakes up and I miss Sleep Powder, it can use Ice Punch and that's devastating for Butterfree. If I can manage to defeat it, Lapras is next, and Blizzard is super effective against Butterfree's flying typing. Additionally, Cloyster, Jinx, and Lapras all have the ability to freeze Butterfree, which adds an additional layer of inconsistency to this fight. Remember how I got through it on Luck last time with three critical hits? Well, this time, I do make it past her after using three rare candies, but it still feels like I'm just waiting for sleep luck to go in my favor. However, since she is the first League member, you can just keep attempting her over and over until you get the luck you need. I'm not losing too much time here. Perhaps the rest of the League will be easy. Bruno sure is. Psychic can take care of all of his Pokemon. Mega Drain is great against the Onyx as well in case Butterfree needs to heal but that isn't really ever going to be an issue. Agatha is next. Psychic is great against all her Pokemon. I use Sleep here because I don't want her to confuse me or set up the Dream Eater combo. Unfortunately, her final Gengar lands Hypnosis and eats Butterfree's dreams. Normally against her, this doesn't happen though. I avoid Hypnosis and I can knock out all of her Pokemon with Psychic and make it to Lance. So, she isn't perfectly consistent, but it's a lot more consistent than the Lorelei fight. Lance is the biggest issue. I use all of my rare candies just fighting him. Since I'm not saving, I burn through so much time making it back to him over and over. Along the way, I continue to lose to Lorelei semi-regularly, which quite frankly got really frustrating. The issue here is that Aerodactyl outspeeds, and Sleep Powder only has 75% accuracy. Just getting to the Aerodactyl is tough. I can get knocked out by Lorelei, Agatha, Lance's Gyarados, or the Dragonairs. The second of which can freeze me, and over the course of these fights, it felt like that was happening way more than it should have. After bashing my head against this wall for a while, I realized this isn't working, even with Reflect. I spend some time training and pick up two more rare candies, which I typically neglect in a regular solo run. I return at level 67 for my 35th attempt. By the way, all of these fights help me realize that Solar Beam is better against Lorelei than Mega Drain. With it, and at this level, I can two-shot Jinx and Lapras. Everything else is a one-hit. It is still possible to lose, but that feels like a rare circumstance now. Bruno and Agatha remain easy. The higher level and super effective damage are just too much for them. Alright, let's defeat Lance now. Against Gyarados, I miss sleep and it lands Hyper Beam right away. Worst possible first turn ever. Next, I manage to put it to sleep and set up Reflect. It proceeds to stay asleep and allows Butterfree to knock it out with three Psychics. Okay, that's more consistent now. It used to take four, but now it's always three. On the first Dragonair, I attempt to heal, but it keeps waking up and damaging me with Thunderbolt. After my third rest, it stays asleep, and I take it down with two Psychics. These are also consistent two hits now. It's time for the terror itself, Aerodactyl. It outspeeds and uses Fly. I need to spam Sleep Powder, and hope that I survive and connect. This is what happens. It's too risky to heal, so I need to just use Psychic and knock it out. It only takes two hits to do that, and Butterfree is finally moving on to Dragonite. I miss my first sleep powder. 
my heart sinks, and it lands blizzard, but I survive. And then I put it to sleep, and I'm able to strike back and knock it out. The champion is last. I add double edge to my moveset so that I can deal with Alakazam and Executor. Psychic is great for most of Kanto, but it really doesn't help much against the champion in yellow. The tactics are the same here as they were before. Sleep Powder into Psychic or Double Edge. Sandslash and Alakazam aren't too bad to take out, but the recoil from Double Edge is really adding up by the time Executor comes out. It has been asleep for a while now though, so I make the tough call and decide to use Rest. I'm lucky enough to finish it off and then I get to move on to Ninetales. It's a two hit. Magneton could be awful, but Sleep lands and I knock it out in three hits. I've made it to Vaporeon. It has significantly worse defense than Special, but I use Psychic here again for the reasons from before. Butterfree knocks it out and finishes the league with a time of 3 hours, 4 minutes, and 18 seconds. When completing the league consistently without saves, Beedrill easily takes both points. It is roughly 50 minutes faster, only required 2 attempts total, and finished 7 levels lower. Overall, Beedrill scores 3 of 4 points in this versus challenge. It feels infinitely better against the League, and its poison typing would make it invulnerable to some of the strongest Pokemon if I was playing Pokemon Red or Blue. For instance, Dugong and the Dragons would just spam status psychic moves and never attack it. If we examine the method by which Butterfree won its only point, it's clear that the margin at 1 by was accumulated during the Brock portion of the game. If the first gym wasn't so much of a wall for Beedrill, it would have won all four points. So that's it. Beedrill is our champion, but Butterfree is still very near and dear to my heart. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, like, subscribe, and share this video with a friend. I'm blown away by all the support on Patreon. Therefore, this credit sequence is now much longer than it was only a few weeks ago. I'll take this time to do a small update about my content. Over June, I've been trying to release two videos a week. To accomplish this, I've been working as hard as is possible to produce content. Additionally, I'm trying to improve the quality of the content as well. As the quality improves, the time required does go up. In the short term, I've decided to let go of the goal of releasing twice a week, and instead just focus on single videos every week that will release on Sunday. I hope that over the next month or two, I'm able to improve my production efficiency and eventually get to a two video per week release schedule. I really love making these videos and I have so many ideas that I just want to bring to life as fast as possible. I can't wait for the time when I can produce even more for you. If you've made it this far, you're incredible and I'll see you in my next video.